Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Media Education Lab. This is our Media Ed blog, and we are joined by Professor Nathalie Nassel and Professor Martin Lalonde, and they are going to be talking about their co authored chapter, Design Based Research into the Co Creation of Teaching Activities for the Theoretical Refinement of a Multimodal Media Literacy Competency Model. Um, we also have uh, one of the editors of the volume in which this chapter has been featured, Professor Pierre Pasté, who joined us today. And a lot of people from uh, different parts of the world in the three continents. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome. Please feel free to use the chat to introduce to yourself. Uh, fair warning. Um, this is being recorded, uh, so please go off with you if you do not want to be part of the recording. Uh, and do keep yourself on mute at all times. And I'm going to be adding a lot of links to chat where you can access the chapter link, uh, the edited volume link, as well as a little bit about the Media Education Lab and the events that we have. Um, some quick introductions. Uh, Nathalie Lestel is a full professor in the Department of Language Didactics at UTAM. Uh, she's also the head of the Multimodal Media Literacy Research Team. Um, and she's head of the Lab for Education in Digital Literature. Uh, she's also the editor in chief of uh, Journal Multimodalité, uh, and her research activities focus on several themes in the field of language didactics, digital literature, information literacy, visual media art. Um, Martha Lalonde is an associate professor at the School of Visual and Media Arts at UCAM. Um, he works as a specialist in innovative pedagogies and didactic visual media arts. And his research focuses on the impact of mobile and ubiquitous digital technologies on teaching and learning in visual arts. And with that, enough of me, over to you, professors. Thank you so much, Divina. You you did my first slide. That's great. <laughs> so you introduced the chapter. It's the eighth chapter, so of the handbook. Um, but that's it. We can start. Um, so uh, let's start with the context. The link between literacy and digital, uh, which is commonly called digital literacy, should form naturally in schools because it is now practically impossible to dissociate the two in everyday communication practices, information practices, and creative practices. However, there are obstacles, most especially a lack of theoretical and empirical knowledge about the processes, the textualities, and the competencies involved in digital literacy. That's how our multimodal uh, media literacy research group came to use design research in education as a methodology to meet the need to theorize, theorize new digital teaching and learning environments through co-creation of multimodal media literacy activities. In fact, you see now an uh, image. Um, Martin, you can change the slide. Yes. Uh, I think it was the one before. Before. Sorry for that. Yeah, I'm still here, Martin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'll tell you when we when we change the slides. Um, so in fact, all the images that you'll see uh, during the presentation um, are taken from school-based research projects aimed at integrating multimodal and digital skills into artistic and literary disciplines. For example, the image that you see on the slide represents a textualization activity for the work application Florence, a textless digital work um, produced by the Australian Studio Mountain and published by the American video game publisher Annapurna. The student that did that uh, project um, decided to sculpt the skeletal form with words evoking the happy moments before the breakup between herself and her uh, ex-partner Krish, illustrating a transfer from subjective reception to recreation of the work in a form of appropriation. 
Next slide. So the general intention of this chapter is to illustrate how DBR, so I'll be calling it DBR, uh, design-based research can be used for digital education research using the example of co-creation of multimodal media literacy activities in school to refine the multimodal media competencies model. Thus, multimodal media literacy in a digital context implies new research topics inspired by social practices of communication and creation, technological development, for example, digital genre, multimodal and digital reading and production, and school-based applications in the form of activities incorporating active methods that uh, are well-known makerspace teaching, learning, STEAM, and co-creation. So the image uh, on the that slide represents the launch of a web story called Si Seulement, If Only, uh, from teenagers in a school uh, that we worked with, for which five large format posters were created, each featuring a photograph of one of the characters and separate makers from the augmented reality application Row R, through which the experience of the participants present was enri enriched. The next slide. So the aim of this chapter is to describe the methodological principle of design-based research identified in recent studies and digital education, and to see how these principles serve as a structuring basis for describing the DBR conducted by our multimodal media literacy research team entitled, entitled co-creation of MML activities in a digital context. So we'll start with two definitions. So DBR is a theory-driven interventionist uh, research method designed by and for educators that seeks to improve the effectiveness and impact of their interventions with the goal of fostering knowledge transfer between research and teaching practices. And multimodal media literacy is a research field that studies the evolution of young people's in school and out of school literacy practices in order to comprehend their specific multimodal and digital skills. In a digital context, MML refers to ability to deploy multimodal skill, for example, combination of linguistic, visual, and oral modes, and digital skills, for example, interaction, interaction, representation and manipulation appropriate to the situation and adapted to the resources available when receiving, um, decoding, understanding, interpreting, and evaluating or producing, designing, creating, and disseminating messages on of any type. So this is the definition we use when talking about digital MML. And I'll let Martin continue with the first part of the article on DBR theory. Thank you, uh, Nathalie. So I'll, uh, in the next few slides, I will present the methodological foundation of, the, of DBR. Uh, since uh, I use that methodology in my research on um, visual-based communication and in, uh, in social media with teenagers uh, prior to uh, join uh, Nathalie in, in, the, in the study that she presented. So uh, it was the work of Anne Brown and Alan Collins that established in 1992 the methodological foundation of what today's education community call design-based research, DBR. It's a research approach based on experimental research that proposed to take into account the complexity of practice settings in the field of educational psychology. So DBR is described as theory-oriented, grounded, pragmatic, collaborative, adaptative, iterative, and it, it's aiming at uh, producing uh, practical innovations and ultimately uh, what they call design principles. I'll get to that later. So first, regarding the theoretical aims of uh, design-based research, uh, studying the details of the deployment, operation, and effectiveness of an educational design enables researchers to analyze an, ed an educational phenomenon or or a teaching and learning topic on which they wish to intervene. So DBR is a methodology that can be used to confirm or disconfirm the theoretical hypothesis that guides a design. Uh, for Sandoval in 2004, 
embodied conjectures occurred in three aspects of the learning environment. First, tools and materials, second, task structures, and third, uh, participation structures. By addressing these, these three aspects in the design process, researchers and practitioners can co coherently align the design with the issues they are trying to influence. According to Edelson in 2002, DBR, which is part of the, the bigger family of design research, has the benefit of being able to generate theoretical knowledge of learning contexts. He explains that design research can be used to develop theoretical contributions on three levels. First, in what they called what he called uh, domain theories, so about uh, teaching methods, educational technologies, uh, professional development model, etc. Second, what he, what he called design framework theories. This means substantive and prescriptive principle to create a working environment for interventions. And third, design methodology theories. So here it's about the nature of a particular design, its form and the expertise requ required. So resources and participants, the role played by the individuals representing the different expertise. Uh, another important aspect of DBR, it's, it's, uh, it's the pragmatic di dimension of its objectives. So, it's mainly used in. Uh, it was mainly used since the beginning of the 2000s in the field of educational technologies, and uh, most of the researchers, when they used this uh, methodologies, they were trying to produce and refine uh, incremental or radical uh, innovations in their own field. <clears throat> um, Sanchez and Mono Ansaldi explained that design-based Educational research is pragmatic in the sense that the work involved helps to design and introduce into the field a techno-pedagogical device that meets a need and expressed by uh, participants and practitioners. Neven and Fulmer identify uh, four quality cr criteria for interventions developed in DBR, which includes first, the relevance of the intervention in relation to the problem in the field, Second, the consistency of its of its structure. Uh, third, practicality in the context for which it is intended. And fourth, effectiveness in meeting the initial objectives. Another key aspect to DBR, it's, it's, it's the collaborative dimension. So the technological device developed is therefore central to the collaboration process. In DBR, devices are approached from a demo democratic angle which encouraged input from the general public and users as to the design and purpose of a technology. Uh, Emil and Reeves states, researchers should not see themselves as external technocrats bringing solution to an envisioned school problems. The issues addressed by educational researchers in school must emerge from the school itself through its constituents. These problems must be negotiated between school members and researchers. So this, uh, this negotiation aspect in the collaboration, it's, a, it's an important aspect. Uh, Mono and Ansaldi and collaborators demonstrates the importance of negotiation in the DBR collaborative process. The aim of which it is to establish a common ground where a consensus is reached as to how the research topic is to be understood. Uh, for us in MML, it has been a, a key aspect where a lot of the first meeting with the participants were aimed at defining those concepts in a, in a, in an academic way, but also in a in a more pragmatic way. So their work shows that DBR negotiations entail the internalizations of a praxeology and results in the production of pedagogical sequences that satisfy both didactic requirements and classroom reality. So through this process, the different perspectives on a conceptual object or a practice become components of new knowledge that is built and coexist in relations to the research to the research topic. So next, regarding the iterative dimension of field research activities, uh, one of the founders of DBR, Alan Collins, uh, really insists on uh, the fact that DBR is some kind of an of an analogy with the field of engineering. 
So the best way to illustrate the iterative dimension of design-based educational research is through analogy with engineering. Collins reflects on this comparison by explaining that developing a prototype based on specific use of technology in a project that pursue a particular objectives forces us to constantly review the features of our prototype. So the iterative element can also be more long-term and extended beyond the framework of a practical intervention. The iterative cycles of DBR can therefore go beyond the design phase to cover implementation and practice, data analysis, and understanding of the concepts related to the research. Uh, on this subject, McKinney and Reeves points out that this dimension could be exploited by researchers who are, who are interested in research topics that are non-static or for which there is, no, there is not a yet clearly defined theory. To do this, they have to divide their research project into smaller study units that can function as bricks in the larger structures that form both interventions and practical artifacts on the one end and increasingly refined knowledge of a conceptual object on the other. So it has been the case here with the, with the research that we are doing in the MML group since uh, Natalie is conducting research since the early uh, 2010s and that those multiple iterations of different research projects um, always aim at the same goal, which is to refine that um, competency framework that we are building here. So uh, formulating uh, design principles, I'm sorry. Just move this. So DBR can generate different kinds of theoretical knowledge. Um, descriptive, substantive, declarative knowledge relating to what learner behaviors are triggered by certain prompts. And on the other end, prescriptive or procedural knowledge relating to how to facilitate learning through the strategic use of a certain prompt types under certain circumstances. So design principles are knowledge that arise in the intermediary stage between identifying the elements that make a local intervention work and formulating scientific findings that must be generalized. So design principles are not instructions or rules governing the implementations of instructions. They are more guides that point to variables that need to be considered when pursuing a goal in a particular context, prioritizing a specific intervention approach and basing these interventions on theoretical conjectures. So design principles can provide a solid foundation on which to build a didactic approach or an educational program. I'll let Nathalie continue. Merci, Martin. So we have now we are now entering the second part of our chapter entitled Using DBR Guiding Principles to Produce and Validate a Multimodal Media Literacy Competency Model. So the concept of contemporary media, multimodal and digital literacy that underlies the MML competencies framework has since, uh, like Martin mentioned it, since early uh, 210s. Uh, been formulated in stages by the members of its design team. The research teams started from knowledge about cognitive, affective, pragmatic, and semiotic literacy skills to incorporate theories on multimodal skills, semiotic combinations of writing, images, sounds, um, for example, writing with hypertextuality or multimodalizing text, and then digital skills, which we're still working on it, um, through uh, competencies, skills like techno-semiotics or techno-gestural skills for writing and producing techno-text. So I'll show you later some examples of those new competencies that we're pointing out right now. So using a cognitive approach, um, uh, the team was able to identify the processes and strategies of reading, writing, and oral communication. A semiotic approach, awareness, uh, knowledge about the characteristic, characteristic of text, gen, genre, and discourses, and a subjective approach led to integration of the emotional and sensory dimensions of the subject reader writer at the time of receiving and creating um, a, a, a text or a production. 
and a pragmatic or social approach introducing knowledge about production and reception context and communication media. However, how, as I said before, the generic and theoretical nature of the model makes it impossible to understand its application in a digital context without contextualizing it in a real life education situation in specific, specific school settings and subjects. So you see here, uh, no, Martin Célab, it's the one before. <laughs> Sorry for that. I'm, I'm, I don't have the control. Um, so the picture in the slide in the back <laughs> was taken during our first co-creation on digital MML, which involved the education department of Bibliothèque and Archive Nationale du Québec, volunteer teachers from underprivileged areas and uh, in Montreal, and researchers in which Martin and I took part, who were invited to collaborate on the creation of digital literacy activities for primary school students using the library digital resources. So next, <laughs> uh, after a few iterations of the co-creation process, we have identified four categories of guiding principles. In the next slides, I will show you examples of adjustments made after each iteration of profiles, process, project and productions based on the DBR dimensions, the four DBR dimensions, the pragmatic, collaborative, explanatory, and iterative, to better explain the theorization process through the study of actual practices in the new digital teaching and learning environment. Next slide. So here is an example of knowledge <clears throat> provided by profiles on settings and participants iteration with the focus on the pragmatic dimension of DBR. Before embarking on the co-creation process, it is important to draw up a profile of teams, um, university co-researchers uh, co and practitioners, but also assistants and students that will be part of the co-creation, the knowledge about the institu institu institution and the digital and material resources available. So a number of obstacles could have been avoided um, with better knowledge of the school's technology resources, for example, the people resources to support teachers in situ and suitable locations in which to install digital devices for con consulting students' production. So that's one of the findings that we started to correct and make it as a, as a guideline for the next iteration. This picture illustrates a co-creation session implicating students who recommended splitting up the digital output of a literature project on Michel Tremblay into different installation and performances. And those were suggested based on the data collected on a similar previous project. So everybody worked together um, um, with with uh, the, the students from the year before and the new students working on that project. And they had some um, input into the project uh, on the base of this, um, this uh, wish that they had that the, 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 there was three di digital output of the project. On the next slide, here are examples of knowledge provided by project and production iterations from a focus on the explanatory dimension of DBR. So the first example about the project, we found that the recurrent request for a project ideation stage on paper proved effective in all projects. It seems that students need to create a physical representation of an idea before they get into a digital project. So this was recurrent enough that we could made it as a guideline for the next iteration of um, the co-creation project. It's just an example. We have many more, but we don't have, I, I, I wanted to give little example to, for you to see how we can articulate uh, the, the both model, the methodological model and the co-creation uh, model. So, 
Another example, the co-creation team's enthusiasm for new technologies led to overuse, uh, to an overuse of technological tools and media that did not take into account the time students needed to assimilate them. So we need to maybe do one, 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 uh, use one tool at a time and make sure that we have time to use it and, and into a project. So another example is that the devices for viewing digital productions were difficult to install in the classroom. So in this project, for example, we decided that there would be an exhibition showcased um, that showcased both the process and the production of artifacts related to a project entitled Cabinet of Curiosity, theme in a physical and digital environment with Genialia. Um, the, the, the project was on Genioli. Uh, on the next slide, here is an example of knowledge provided by iterations of the co-creation process with a focus on the collaborative dimension of VBR. So several stages of this process, especially those concerning, concerning student involvement had to be reviewed. Um, they were so much involved that it took too much time to 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 uh, consult them at every stage of of the project. So we decided to have a guideline that they should be involved at the ideation stage and at the evaluation stage. And in between, we only worked with a smaller team, and this was very. Uh, helping and more productive for the next iteration of the project. On the next slide, as we have seen, adjustment based on the principles of the four categories, profile, process, project, and production, and the four dimensions of DBR, pragmatic, explanatory, exploratory, collaborative, sorry for my English, <laughs> and iteration. Um, permitted validation of the methods to facilitate the integration of digital tools into classroom literacy activities through the co-creation process. So the iterations really help adapting and validating the MML model. For example, after nearly a dozen experiments, actually that was written in the article, but um, we're more than 20 experiments now, and we lately worked with artificial intelligence um, co-creation project also. Uh, so this will be for the next book. <laughs> um, in, in various school settings and subjects, the research team identified several guiding principles for co-creation. So that, that was really positive that we could use um, uh, feedbacks and knowledge from one one project uh, to apply to another project and another project so we could we would meet um, and it, it was through uh, almost 10 years of, of projects. So it's not finished because there's always something new, but it's a work in pro progress and we found that by guiding our project with the DBR and documenting with the 4P uh, method uh, co of co-creation, it, it's helpful to, to uh, redesign the LMM, MML grid model. So next example, digital skills were integrated, um, the MML grid. So all the projects are documented. You can see that's the latest grid uh, in which we have techno it's in French. We'll, we'll pu publish it in English uh, soon. Um, so, but we still have to work on it. So it's adding uh, competencies uh, on techno-semiotic um, competencies, meta-techno-semiotic, meta and it's, it's techno-text oriented, very techno-literature or, or documentary oriented. Um, so, you can see in French, and you can go in our laboratories website, which is called Labyrinth. Maybe uh, Martin can put it in the chat. Um, it's in French, but uh, 
there's a lot of, uh, we're, we're adding a lot of things all the time because it's, it, so all the projects that we do, we document them in the same ways and, and we describe um, uh, productions from artists, but also from students um, using digital tools that are also documented. So everything is always documented, but relating to the MML grid. So next example, um, then the next slide. So as I presented before, the students added augmented reality characters from their web series to the posters they produced for the launch of the first of 10 episodes of their web series, um, which is available on YouTube. Uh, it's called uh, Si Seulement. So in creating this installation, the students used cognitive skills. Uh, so they, they were extracting keys information about the characters. They used pragmatic skills, thinking about the viewer's experience. They used semiotic skills, splitting the narrative into segments. Uh, model skills, creating a poster using visual codes and multimodal skills, creating a multimodal package of a fictional story that is broad broadcast on several media in a whole new way because they were experimenting for the first time with the format made possible by a new technology. So this is how each project helps to validate the MML competency model, which um, in turn uh, guides the introduction of new topics in the teaching of the subject. So as a conclusion, um, short conclusion, uh, so the design-based uh, research methods uh, used by the MML team um, to facilitate, uh, and, and maybe we can put the, um, the, the, the website of the team so you can see everyone because I cannot name all the team. We're about 20 um, in, in Canada uh, and 20 over uh, outside of Canada. So there's about 40 uh, researchers working in the team. So, so conclusion, um, uh, the design-based methods used by the MML team to facilitate the introduction of digital skills in schools proved necessary in order to ensure that the theories can evolve in step with the empirical context. Since DBR attempts to take everything into account at once, we believe it is the ideal methodology to facilitate the introduction of digital skills in schools. And out of school, because we've been working in, working in cultural uh, institution also. So, Martin, maybe you can uh, take over. Martin, oh, your, your microphone is closed. Thank you. Yes, I was reading the questions on the chat, and there's a lot of questions regarding the, 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 the practical and the field work. So, but just before we get into that, uh, some some further readings, uh, if you are interested in the in the in the DBR methodology based uh, research. So first of all, uh, the research of Mono and Saldi examined in details the collaborative work of DBR project that involves actors of different institutional institutional and professional backgrounds. This research makes a contribution by formulating a theory around the role of negotiation in the process of internalization and constructions of shared praxeologies, just like us in the context of collective knowledge building. Uh, it's a similar work that you will find with uh, Bogertz and uh, Hasenberg. Um, quickly on uh, Fazio and Gallagher, they seek to use DBR to contribute to teachers in service training through the use of digital technology. Their results are presented in the form of practical considerations aimed at those in charge of teacher training. Um, I've, I have not insisted on that aspect since uh, the topic of our chapter was on the, the theoretical contribution of DBR, but also, and uh, as you will see in the resource that we are sharing, uh, there is also the this, this second part to DBR that it's aimed at producing uh, practical material, practical contribution, 
aimed at uh, resolving certain issues or certain needs in the field. So of course we are uh, sharing all this uh, all this material that has been uh, conceptualized, tested, and implemented in those fields through the various platform uh, associated with the uh, uh, MML group uh, that uh, Natalie is conducting. So uh, we'll stop there because I've seen some interesting questions in the chat. So uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you so much, professors. And now we throw it open to the attendees. Um, in case you have questions, this is the time to come off mute and on video if you'd like to do that, or you could also post your questions in chat. And while people are gathering their thoughts, I'd like to invite quickly Professor Pierre Faspe, who is the editor of this volume, to maybe say a few words about uh, the chapter, about the section, the volume in general. Yes, uh, thank you, Davina. Um, and thank you all for attending this webinar. We are really proud and excited to, to uh, be able to have these different sessions uh, on different chapters of the book, uh, and certainly on, on this particular chapter on design-based research. Um, as I was saying before you started the recording very early in the session, uh, the book has 15 chapters. We organized them in, in three different sections according to the main uh, object of research uh, that the research me methods um, explained in the chapters address. So the first section is on uh, media practices, and so research methods for studying media practices and digital media practices. The second section uh, and the chapter that Nathalie and, and Martin presented today is part of this second section, is on research methods for studying uh, and evaluating um, educational initiatives in media literacy and media literacy education. And then the third section is on what we call prescript prescriptive discourses, which uh, include but are not limited to public policies in media education, uh, but also it's all kinds of institutional um, uh, discourses on, on media education. So yeah, we, we are... Um, actually quite happy with the result of the um uh of the book without without bragging with which is not really my type and really happy to have been able to um find so many uh interesting contributors and to work with them towards uh, providing i think what uh what is today a one-of-a-kind volume on research methods on media literacy and media education uh, research so that's that's it for my own personal plug on the uh on the book thank you I also have questions, but I will leave it to the audience members to ask the first questions. Thank you so much. And like I said, it's open uh, to the floor for questions. You could put it in chat or you could come uh, off mute and on video and ask. Professor Azamin, did you have, to have something to say? Donna? Yeah, Hi. Um, am I muted? No, no, have... no, I'm not muted. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question related to the um, population that you use, like you were using some in Canada, 20 students approximately, and then 20 in a, a countries opposite Canada. And my question is this, I, I am not a DBR expert, but I always am looking for ways to understand a methodology that would probably answer some questions I have. Could you comment on what happens when you have a population that is not there in person, um, virtual? Can I, can I start? Um, it, well, we have to adapt all the time. <laughs> so one of the project, uh, recent project that I had the project Florence, for example, one of the first one that I, that I showed was mm -hmm. made totally online. I never went into class and it was in France and in Quebec. Uh, so we worked um, with teachers. Uh, we didn't have students on that one. We'd only had researchers and, and teachers, but we could relate to what students told us about other projects that were similar. So that's what we try to do all the time. We list things that we, we documented in different contexts, but we document the context and we try to find the, the guidelines that are 
similar to the context that that could be useful in the, the context that we we are working on. And um, it was really interesting because on that project, we asked teachers to to read uh, digital uh, stories, um, and they had never read digital stories, and um, they 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 and we wanted them to talk about their reading experience first um because we knew that was uh, also used in a class with students so so and it was positive to use it like this to be first readers and then talk about what we what we do when we read digital stories and what we need to work on <laughs> so and and that's uh when uh, they choose only one um, one story, and they they made it in a four class in France and four class in Quebec, with different students, different levels, <laughs> different contexts, cultural context. Uh, but uh, the teachers adapted adapted uh, to their context because we documented those contexts. It, I don't know if it's helping, but that's the only total online project that I did. The other projects, um, I we we went into schools or library or and but those projects are done without us after we don't stay there. <laughs> they they do the the years after and then sometimes they we can get together uh, and talk about how the iterations went. I, I can't hear. You're, you're, you're muted, Sorry. Donna. Yes, I said thank you very much. <clears throat> that clarifies for me, Natalie, about the logistics, and I appreciate that. This, this sort of echoed my question in chat as well, where I was asking if DBR could also work across schools where teachers and students come from different contexts. Because in India, for example, we have schools which have different curricula and also different funding. So some schools are private schools. They have smart boards and fancy technology in school versus some are state funded. So even if they have blackboards and chalk, that's mm -hmm. a huge deal. And yeah, I, I think maybe the fact that you can have contexts map onto the project when you begin yeah. Share experience. It it might it might help. Um, to to the question in chat about the practical application of it. Um, in the exploratory dimension, when you say that students need to ideate on paper, was it using some specific tools from a list provided by you, the researchers, or was it chosen free from by students? Well, first, it's students that asked in many co-creation uh, at the same time. We were talking the researchers to each other and and with everybody was saying, well, they don't want to go into the dig digital um, uh, tools first. Um, but we were using what there was what they had around them, you know, so if it was a, a post it or uh, some brought in as a uh, large papers that we wrote on then they said well we need to add things so we took the post-it over the the paper so the ideation was also building with the need of some um um analogic uh um equipment i, I don't know if it's clear but um so no it it was coming from what was available around us and what they felt they need. But in a previous um, research uh, on um, uh, young uh, adolescent um, teenagers' um, uh, 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 artistic um, creations, uh, we found that most of their digital production was thought and made um, uh, multi monomodal practices in analogic world and brought into the digital world so we already had that intuition mm. so we could address it to the to the student yeah, i could uh, i could also add something uh, natalie um 
the, yeah, so the, the, the first, the, the needs were um, phrased, were formulated by the, the, the participants and, the, and their teachers. But uh, what, what is interesting here, one of the one of the field was one of the site was the uh, a cultural institution, uh, a public library. Uh, and they have this educational um, service uh, sector where they um, where they, um, they they host all kinds of workshops aimed at teachers to use uh, new kinds of technologies. So on their side, they were eager to um, to use all sorts of fancy technologies, little robots, green screens, uh, all sorts all sorts of new uh, you know apparatus like this. But the the the, the field work what it demonstrates is that even then they didn't have the, um, the 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 proper training and the proper skills to use those tools. And when we were developing with the with the teachers in their class, it it uh, it came back to more um, basic and simple uh, instructions aimed at the development of the of the MML skills of the kids with with leaving all those uh, technological aspects kind of behind. I'm don't I don't know if uh, I don't know if I'm clear. So. You had some questions, Pierre. Yes. Um, actually, the, my, my question is about what happens after the projects. Uh, so I, I understand that um, when you're doing these, these projects and, and, and these workshops, sometimes they kind of take up a, a life of their own and they continue beyond your own presence, which is fascinating and great. But I'm, I'm also wondering about how how one may kind of distribute or, or or make the project radiate beyond its initial run or its initial application uh, across different populations of teachers and and, and learners. So um, there is such a like a, a tight knit um, web of interactions between you, the teachers, the participants um, that generates so much input and then so much insights into the uh, the the competency models and the design principles. How do you go about um, allowing people to replicate or to practice what you found without you? So if, if other teachers wanted to, to, to practice the inclusion of, of digital skills and digital technology into the classroom based on your research, but not as part of one of your projects, how does that happen? What kind of communication, what kind of tools do you have to design to, to, to make it workable and to, to kind of ensure that they can do the, the bootstrapping without you? Do you want me to answer, Martin? Do you want me to start? Yeah, you can start. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Pierre, oh, for the question. <laughs> the thousand million dollar question. What's next? <laughs> um, well, most of the the schools or cultural institution in which we worked, uh, when we left, um, everybody was able to reproduce uh, the activity and other activities too, because they acknowledge their capacity to do it. It's like a, a it's kind of a, a, a school digital literacy uh, project, you know? So, so it's not, it's not all the schools, but it, it's, it, it's, um, Actually, it, 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 it's not a, a gen, the generalization that you're talking about, but it's a small one. Um, and the other um, strategies that uh, we worked on is um, to document all those projects and to link them to the MML grid. Um, I know in Ontario recently they did their new program and they introduced they in, integrated the MML and digital. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come in Quebec, but when it does, there's a lot of resources that we're structuring so that it can um, help the teachers uh, do those projects based on those principles because they're based, they're, they're methodological principles. So we cannot uh, model on the first experience because it's an experience. We need to have iterations, but there's guidelines that we try to um, to document. So we do it on 
Labyrinth, which is a, a website that I talked about, and in the uh, journal, multimodality journal, the last volume, 18, um, the second part, there's eight articles who document eight projects. So the researchers, they wrote with the teachers and the assistants. So we have three, four, four, five authors sometimes, but everybody wrote, worked on writing and formalizing the project so they can be shared in an article. Uh, it's, it's really helping in um, university uh, courses, classes, uh, because it's, it's very pragmatic. We can see what you, they can see what they can do, but it's related to theory that they can read about. Um, so that's what we did, Pierre. I don't know. I, I don't know how to do more for now. I think There's I really one. believe I believe in in time. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you, Natalie. But there's more. Uh, we uh, in Quebec, we have uh, there's there's a political aspect uh, to it as well. Yes. And this is where um, the recognition of Natalie and the group that she leads uh, come into play, because uh, it comes back to the discussion we were having informally in the beginning of this session here. Um, in Quebec, we still don't have uh, a proper um, framework for uh, digital uh, competency and uh, MML competency, or at least it's not impl officially implemented yet. So uh, we are working closely uh, as partners with the Ministry of Education instance, uh, for example, in, uh, literacy, in, in the field of Natalie, uh, language uh, didactics, and in my field, uh, uh, visual arts and art education, where we have those instances that are, um, I don't know how, to, how you call it in English, but it's, uh, it's kind of pedagogical counselors that are training um, all, the, all the teachers in the province and making sure they understand uh, the new guidelines properly and they point out to a specific resource, practical resource, like the one we are producing. So we have those partnerships with the Ministry of Education that help that helps us um, uh, contribute uh, it in the advancement of the the whole LMM MML uh, competency framework and its application in the Quebec curricula. Merci, Martin. I forgot, but it. So it's so important because on each co-creation group, we always have some a, a person um, um, from Le Récit. So the, the, the people that work, uh, that are mandated from the government to, um, to going to schools and, and, and integrate the digital, digital literacy um, competences. So they are very important. They even make uh, on, uh, uh, online um, formation, uh, auto, for, auto formation, yeah. And they take our project because they, they made many auto formation on projects that we conducted in the schools. And they, they, they sometimes uh, um, um, add the experience of the teacher that was working with us. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to share something that was uh, DM'd to me by one of the attendees. Uh, unfortunately, she had to leave because she had to join another meeting in like two minutes. Uh, but uh, she is very, very thankful to you for presenting this work today. It's very exciting uh, to see this sort of uh, project happening and the scope for replication of these sort of uh, projects across contexts. And uh, good news for the editors, she already has a hard copy of the book, <laughs> so yay. Um, unfortunately, this is all the time we have today. Thank you so much, uh, speakers, um, professors, LaSalle, Alon, Lestre, all the attendees. Um, I'm, I've already shared in chat all the events that we could be having the next few days at the Media Education Lab. 
Uh, but something that I wanted to share uh, is happening on the 15th of February uh, is Innovative Mobile Communication in Crisis. And this is part of our webinar series on inequalities in education, where Professor Kerry Stevens is going to be talking about a really exciting project that she could implement in Texas and help citizens take control of uh, mobile technology to be able to help uh, flood-ravaged areas uh, in Texas where they were living. So I hope to see you there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Divina. <laughs> thank you, Pierre, for being there also. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, yes. thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Divina. See you next time. Bye, yeah. bye. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Bye, Thierry. Bonjour, Thierry. <laughs> Ça fait longtemps. <laughs>